Muy buenos días o tardes. Pronto comenzaremos. Good morning or afternoon. Webinar. Very shortly we'll get started with our webinar. Muy buenos días o tardes. Good morning or afternoon for those of you in other latitudes. Welcome to this webinar on ChatGPT, artificial intelligence, and what higher education institutions should know about it. I'm Claudia del Cas Barrios from the communications team of UNESCO International Institute for Higher Education in the American and the Caribbean ESL. Latin American and the Caribbean. The artificial intelligence chat box, chat, chat GPT, has reached 100 million users in a few months of, uh, and of a time that it has been released. And at the same time, it has generated a lot of opinions about it. Many different higher education institutions have already banned this tool because of a fear of plagiarism, while at the same time, many other teachers professors, students, and scholars have welcomed this latest technological advance. These and many other questions will be analyzed in this online webinar in which Ariana Valentine, analyst for the research team at USL, at ESL, will be there for you to actually answer to all of these questions. She will be joined by Frances Pedro, director of UNESCO ESALC, and together they will be with Axel, who's coming from the San Andreas University, and also he is the academic director in terms of everything that has to do with the academic staff in Argentina. And they will tell us and they will take us through this very interesting topic in terms of chat GPT. In terms with this, in regards of this seminar, UNESCO ESL would release a guide, which is going to be an initiation guide, and at the same time, it is going to perform a webinar, a seminar on this matter on its campus. At the same time, we want to take advantage to say that this event, it is going to be released both in Spanish and English, and it has simultaneous interpretation. In order to do so, we kindly encourage you to select the language of your preference in the bottom part of your screen. Also, if you have any questions, please remember to post your questions in our chat box. Please remember that this seminar is, this webinar is also being disseminated through the YouTube channel. And once it is done, we will release our recording. So, Without any other further ado, would like to welcome Frances Pedro, Director at ESALC. Uh, Mr. Director, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Claudia. I should start by saying, or by acknowledging with a very humble heart that I, but we weren't expecting these many people joining us today. And we are usually used to having, let's say, a lot of participation in our webinars. But just to let you know, there are almost 6,000 people registered for this webinar. We've done all of our best for all of our technological resources to be able to cope up with everything. And hopefully Mercury, the god of technology, is going to be in our favor. And But I just wanted to say how impressed I am by these number of registries and how happy I am to see all of this number of interested people in this in such interesting matters. And I also wanted to thank Axel Rivas, whom I am very friends with, and we've met, we've been friends since many decades ago, but he definitely is one of the best experts there is in terms of educational policies, but also he's an expert in all the risks that have to do with these, let's say, risks or opportunities in terms of all of these latest developments. So I also believe that it is uh, that Part of the success of this call has to do with uh, who is our second guest, which is a chat GPT, who is going to be, let's say, which I think it is going to help us understand how it works and what are the different opportunities and limitations that we may have by using it. And just like Claudia has already said it, please let us remind you that we are going to uh introduce you to our latest guide in terms of the use of this chat for the development of our capacities if 
uh, I can actually give you, let's say, a little bit of a, something for you to have in mind is that it is important for us to get to know more about this tool, because if we don't know this tool, it is going to be very difficult for us to use it in a very, let's say, effective and proper way. With that, I'll go back to you, Claudia. Now with that, we'll give the floor to Ariana Valentini. And in order for us to get to know each other a bit better, we are going to invite you to use this tool Mentimeter so you, we can actually get to know each other. Good morning and good afternoon, depending on when, where you are. Uh, briefly, you will see a QR code for you to actually log into this Menti platform. You can do so through your mobile device with this QR code or by visiting this website www.menti.com so you can uh, you can answer the questions that we have there for you. We'll give you a couple of seconds for you to go there and so we get to know who is joining us. Just as the director has just said it, uh, we have a lot of people who are joining us today. So before getting started with today's webinar, before getting started with today's conversation with Axel and with our director, we would like to know who are joining us today and from where they're joining us. So if possible, please use your mobile device to use this QR code, or you can also follow this website that is on screen, www.menti.com. So you can actually follow this code that you can see on the screen and you can answer the questions that we have prepared for you. So we'll give you just a couple of minutes for you to go to this website and answer the questions that we have for you. All right, I think that we can see uh, some of your answers. All right, we can see professors, 540 something. Uh, let me see who else is over here. Some students, some public officers, directors, or staff from, high, from any higher education institution some other people from the education system. But as of now, the most, let's say, the biggest presence that we have in this conference is a professor at or researcher in any kind of a higher education institution. So uh, welcome to you all. And we hope that this is an important scenario for you, for all of you, where you can learn a lot out of this that we have today. Okay, we have new stakeholders from this educational system, directors, management team from a higher education institution. And in our comments, I can see that you are joining us from different countries in Latin America. Please be welcome to this event. All right, maybe now we can move on to the second question. And now uh, the next question is whether you have used or not this tool, ChatGPT. Have you used it before? Most of you have used it. Perfect. We are still waiting on some of your answers. Some other of you haven't tried it yet because you haven't had the time. And very little, uh, some of you have also tried it and have liked it already. And some others haven't tried it yet and don't want to try it. And we can see how your responses keep on coming in. So we can see how they're very close, uh, the ones that are that have tried and also the ones of you who haven't tried it. So hopefully by the end of today's uh, session, you're going to have some further tools so you can actually use this tool, ChatGPT. Very good. Most of you, some of you have already tried it. Some of you have tried it and actually loved it. 
So we can see how diverse these responses are and how rich this, this discussion will be today in terms of higher education. So maybe, and now we can move on to the next question. Now, the next question is a more kind of a personal question. What question uh, comes to your mind whenever you hear this term, chat GPT? So in the last few days that we've heard a lot about chat GPT, what word comes to your mind? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Artificial intelligence, challenges, communication, assistance, prediction. Well, in artificial artificial intelligence is one of the most important words. We can see how this cloud uh, populates as you respond to this question. Uh, here we can see some other interesting words such as fear, challenges, and yes, it is true. We're going to be talking about the different risks or different fears that may arise whenever we hear about this artificial intelligence. Here we can also see advanced technology uh, solutions and many others. But I think the biggest or the most important word that comes to your mind is artificial intelligence, but also challenges. Very good. I think that this can also let us see what we think, what we feel whenever we talk about chat GPT and how diverse our opinions are. So I think that it is going to be this discussion is going to be very important for all of us in terms of what it has to do with higher education. Very good. Thank you very much. And uh, now we can move on to the next to the next question that is a more specific question and has to do with higher education and the use of ChatGPT and its uses. And at this point, we would love to know what do you think are the key functions are the key most useful tools or functions in terms of chat GPT for the application. So here we can see how your answers move on really quick. So we can see how the different functions can actually rank here. So first of all, it says uh, aid in research, explaining complex ideas, creating content. And now it is in fourth place. And the third place, it is actually drafting an essay or an email which is also very important so we can see how or what the potential use of chat gpt is for higher education and and the most useful feature has to do with research so this research that we can conduct in different higher education institutions all right very good I see also some comments that are specified or that are providing some details in how they can, uh, let's say, help these research processes at higher ed education institutions. Uh, for example, also alternatives for searching or acquiring on information. And if possible, and if you've used a chat GPT already in any of these or the different roles that you played, you can also let us know how you have used a chat GPT. As a matter of an example, uh, later on, we'll share all of this information with the participants of this event. So if you have already used chat GPT for research aims or for expressing complex ideas, Please let us know how you have used ChatGPT and how useful has it been for you. All right. Uh, given these very interesting answers that you have provided us with, now we will show you a short video in terms in which ChatGPT is going to tell us what it is all about. Explain ChatGPT in 50 words. 
I'm a language model created by artificial intelligence based on GPT. So you can see here how it explains itself. So it says that I am created by OpenAI, created or based on architecture 3.5. I can generate coherent text and answer to different questions in many different languages using the automatic learning purposes. And my knowledge covers many different aspects from very general knowledge to very to very specialized knowledge. And I can actually enrich everything I know by interacting with different users. Now that we know a bit more about ChatGPT, we will answer some of the questions that our participants have asked themselves that are going to be answered by both ChatGPT, Frances Pedro, and also our special guest, Axel Rivas. So let's proceed. So the first question that we will ask ChatGPT has to do about the possible uses of ChatGPT in the different learning and teaching processes in higher education. So let's start by reading what ChatGPT has to say for this question. So ChatGPT is telling us that as a specialist of higher education, it believes that ChatGPT could have many different uses in these learning teaching processes in higher education. For example, being a, a learning assistant or providing virtual tutoring. It also tells us that it is able to create contents and it can also assist our research such as many of you have already mentioned during, uh, during the last section of this talk. And it also talks about drafting abstracts. So in summary, it is very useful for this teaching learning process in higher education. So these uses that we have mentioned are just some examples on how this technology could be used in order to enhance the learning of the different learners. Uh, uh, Mr. Director, please, the floor is yours. Well, to be honest, I have to say that ChatGPT has provided us with very optimistic responses or answers. And I think that this is a situation in which many of us are have already seen. But here it is important to think about the future that we are looking forward to but later on we'll talk about the limitations of the system but to be honest this disruptive tool together with some other tools that we'll see in terms of what we call the artificial intelligence in terms of this dialogic kind of dynamic we can see how it is changing or transforming the reality of those people who are let's say in charge of this knowledge management, not only as professors, but also as managers of education. And I think that this is very important because I myself, as the director of the institution, uh, let's say that in more than one occasion have used this tool and I have found it very useful as a draft. Uh, let's say as to draft, let's say a concept note or for me to have a specific abstract or some summary on some information. So I would say that uh, I would use this kind of tools as to, let's say, as if they were, let's say, as if it were the calculator, the electronic calculator that we had back in the day, and specifically for mathematics, and specifically in everything that has to do with the training of professionals that, ha that are linked to, to this management of knowledge. And here we need to go back to this example of the calculator and how they used it. And some of you may remember the, the different the different challenges that we had with this. And of course, we have seen how how difficult it has been for, let's say, for some people to explain the concepts that are adjacent to this, to this calculus or to don't, or to some mathematics areas. But it is without a doubt a very interesting 
tool that people have been able to use. But I think that in that sense, it is important to see how we can use it and how there should be some training, some minimum training in terms of how to use it, in terms of how to use these tools, because it could save us some time and tons of headaches only if by the end of the process, this training of this end user, it is going to help this end user to, to tell apart what they have before them. Because I think this is very important. And from this perspective, from this angle, and I would like to conclude with that, because I think that Axel will have a lot more to say on this aspect. I think that this tool, it is going to enable us in higher education to change this relationship that we used to have between the students, professors, and also the sources of information. Because here we're not talking about sources of knowledge, but sources of uh, we're not talking about sources of knowledge, but sources of information. We know that there are some limitations that are important to have in mind, and I'm sure that we're going to be talking about that, but we can see this substantial change in terms of how to access to this information, and there are many different perspectives to have in mind here. It is as if, as if we were using a browser in terms of cholesterol. It is going to provide us with a lot of information. It is going to provide us with information in such way that is written down in a coherent way. And it is also going to provide us the opportunity to actually start a conversation and to have this interaction for, to clarify those things that are not quite clear. And I think that this is very important because by changing this relationship, it is possible for the students to use this as a starting point. It is as if we were building up, let's say a textbook any time that they have a question. So I think that this is very important. But on the other hand, I think that this tool goes beyond, let's say, beyond being a bridge to accessing information. But I think that this is also a very important management uh, tool because I think that it actually uh, said it itself that it is actually going to help them to manage this knowledge. For example, whenever they say, or they ask, how could I understand better such topic? Most of the times, this tool that is going to help us out with some assistance. For example, this is useful whenever we have, for example, we have done it ourselves as professors, because for example, we have helped our students by giving them some summaries. And this is kind of the, help or the assistance that we can get through chat GPT because it is going to help us to manage that information for us to have a let's say a more let's say a clearer perspective on how to tackle on a specific topic and I would say that in principle it doesn't do it yet but it is going to take us there is to modify the different assessment mechanisms or evaluation mechanisms and I'm sure that we're going to have very interesting debates in that sense and we will see that in the upcoming months and that's what we've seen so far because we've seen many different universities that are uh banned this tool in some of the universities in different countries because they have had to go back to the traditional exams so they are not they're going to avoid plagiarism or they're going to avoid any cheating but i would say that by doing so we're just trying to cover the sun with just a single hand, but we should actually transform what we must or what we have been doing, because this is pretty much what is showing us what we must be capable capable of in terms of the skills and how we are going to assess the, the skills that we have nowadays. And I think that in that sense, there are very different and interesting elements for us to have a new sort of universitary pedagogy and now thanks to having these functions and having these compilation functions of course with its limitations by but by having this management of information that are going to be let's say addressed to a specific tool which i would call the calculator of knowledge as to continue with the metaphor of the calculator, we could, with this tool, with this calculator, we can see what the importance of managing better the information it is going to be like in the future. And I'm going to stop there as to open up the floor to Axel and his insights on this very interesting aspect. Well, thank you very much for these reflections, for these questions and these expectations that you have posed 
and your comments. And now with the same question, we'll go uh, to Axel Rio so he can give us his insights on this matter. Thank you very much. And I'm very pleased to be with you today reflecting in terms of something that is very dynamic and that pose many different questions to what we to what to our day-to-day -day work and now i think that in terms of the different uses that we can give chat gpt i'm going to mention just two of them the first of them is the ability to potentiate different teaching processes and i think that here we have a new reality which is having a real a real life assistant which is a person who, are, who we're going to be talking to it is not let's say uh anyone but a person that is specifically there for us at answering to our question so it is going to shape our ideas it is going to help us shape our ideas so for i think that for those of you who come from a very specific area you be and that you believe that this is uh, let's say very close to yeah i think that this assistant is very useful in terms because uh it, it is for example it, most of the times we wonder about uh the real how reliable the information that we access on the internet is but here uh, for example we can see how they can manage this information how they're going to for example how this tool that is going to help us out to find new information and i think that this is a great assistant for professors and i think that this is also a great opportunity to customize learning because this is something that we have already seen in the in the let's say in the latest years and i think that this is an exponential hub in that sense in terms of or this is an exponential opportunity for us to see how this artificial intelligence can actually establish a conversation so they can actually together work or shape new ideas or new understandings because sometimes there are situations in which students they don't fully understand a specific subject so by having this opportunity to establishing a conversation with someone else who's there to answer those questions those specific questions i think that these kind of conversations are very similar to the ones that you can establish with a private tutor which is one of the biggest let's say lacks or the biggest failures that we have in our current educational system because sometimes we don't even have the time to actually wonder what are those things that we don't fully understand so by having this online assistant or this online tutor we have a very important opportunity of change in terms of the rhythm or the pace of knowledge or the pace of shaping this knowledge so i think that it's a very interesting opportunity and now thinking beyond this let's say this more immediate order that we have in mind and just like frances said it before i think that this is let's say this let's say this knowledge calculator and I think that this could actually be implemented to what we have done in different processes throughout history. For example, the typing machine, we could see how it marked a difference in the moment because we have that, for example, we know that with the typing machine, we are not going to be able to edit what we wrote. We have a very limited space for mistakes. But once we switched to computers, then everything changed in terms of how you shape your ideas. And for example, you can brainstorm and yet then you can go back and forth whenever you want to edit it. And today I would say that we are facing a very similar process in that in terms of how we can actually establish this conversation with our own knowledge with ourselves and how we can actually shape all of these ideas in writing and i think that in that sense it's an invitation for us to be centers of these mythological beings that are for example in this case it would be part uh, machine and part human and this is a generational change that we can see before us and then we have to actually about it and we have to think about how this interaction is going to be like but i would say that first of all we must be very open to exploring this tool to seeing how 
our mind, how our knowledge can be shaped with these support tools that we now have that are going to help us to have a new, to redefine the way that we think, the way that we write, the way that we express ourselves. And we would say, I would say that I would like to encourage you in these days to explore this tool, different uh, from what we have from the tapping machine to this transition between the tapping machine and the computer with the use of calculators. I would say that we know that it just became massive 20 years after its release, but with ChatGPT has just been released six months ago so that's why i think it is very important for us i know that we can have the opportunity i know that it has been very short in time but my invitation is for you to explore it and i ask you to be patient for us uh let's say to have this learning process because it is going to help us out and to reshape the way that we uh, that we used to think the way that we used to write the way that we used to shape our knowledge because sometimes if we don't do it, we can get outdated. So I think we're facing fascinating times, but we should also be reflective and be patient with it. Without a doubt, the exponential advance can be overwhelming sometimes that we have to learn how to cope with it and how to live with it in, it's in the most uh, positive way. Please let me remind you that these initial questions that we're posing today we have received more than 3,500 questions, and it's been very difficult to actually see, to actually select just a couple of them to be able to raise them here in this webinar, but we'll do our best to do so. Now let's move on to the second question that we have proposed for this webinar. Why ChatGPT has created or has raised some concerns in this academic scenario? And we'll start, as we did before, with the ChatGPT answer to this, to this very interesting question. And here we requested ChatGPT to be, to perform as if it were a specialist in higher education. And we asked it to answer the question that Claudia has just told us about. Why has ChatGPT posed or raised some concerns in the academic scenario. And it says that it has posed some concerns because it is creating some coherent responses and how plagiarism could be a great risk in this term because it is generating high quality tests as we can see right now and how, the, how students could use this feature to actually write many different academic papers and the third reason is that academics or scholars and so scholars are concerned in terms of how they have used chat gpt to create fake news or to create misinformation which could pose a risk not only to higher education but also the society itself all right very good so now we're going to ask the same question to our experts uh Mr. Director, the floor is yours. Well, I would have uh, described this differently, but I would say that it all goes down to a single concept, which has to do with academic integrity. And I think that what, let's say what we have with this tool is showing us the need of reinventing this concept this academic integrity because now we have new tools that are posing a risk in terms of the transformation that we're witnessing today and this has to do as well with let's say with our assistant just as uh axel named it and it, this has to do with the let's say with the different risks of plagiarism and this is also providing us with the possibility of creating this fake news and in that sense i would say that we have seen in more than one occasion chat gpt creating actually uh, uh fake uh, bibliographical references so or academic references so we got to be very careful with it but it doesn't have to do with how good or how evil this tool may be but 
it is actually giving us a new challenge, which is how the higher education is understanding this concept of academic integrity. So let me give you a couple of examples in that sense. So we are all aware of the importance of, for example, the fight or the battle against plagiarism in this academic world or in this academic scenario. But what, or let's say, what professor or who is responsible to assess in this advance in this kind of knowledge in terms of what plagiarism is or is not? or how to actually, how to quote these sources, this bibliographical information. But it is also true that both the students and professors have to be aware of the limitations of this tool. It's in that, in that sense, how reliable this tool is in terms of the, for example, in terms of the qualitative data that we have, for example, in 2021, we have seen how it has advanced from uh, back from 2021, but here we have a very important limitation for us to have in mind, specifically for those people who are working in the science areas. For example, if we're talking about biomedicine or different researches, very, very specific searches. So I think that it's very important for us to wonder about this, about this academic integrity, but also what are we doing to promote this higher education, let's say this academic integrity in higher education for us to actually tell apart what it is or what it is not. And on the other hand, which I also think that it's very important to have in mind, and it is that if students are tempted to use this tool to promptly answer the different demands in terms of essays or in terms of papers that they are required to write, and then we need to actually ask ourselves what's behind this. And in that sense, I would say that it's very different to ask a student to say that, let's say that you are going to have a three month deadline for you to provide me with, let's say an essay in which you are going to tell me about the difference between the French and the American Revolution. And then they forget about the student. And then I'm just gonna wait for, for this essay to be dropped in my desk or it is going to be completely different. Or what if I ask my student to give me a first draft in a week, and then I want my student to tell me which sources are they going to use. So this is pretty much actually questioning what we have done so far. For example, in terms of how we request this essays, maybe it has been, or maybe the answer has to do with the way that we have handled education so far and how we can actually respond to 150 students at the same time. But let's say that we know that this is not the best way of learning. Maybe this is, let's say, some of the functions that we have within ChatGPT. Is it something that we are going to be learning? But I think that this is going, this is showing us the value that it has by having this relationship between a student and professor. And in that sense, if a student feels that they cannot use chat GPT in such way that it is going to, let's say, to help them answer some questions that they may have, uh, or if a student, or actually if a professor could be actually exchanged by a machine, so what's the worth of this professor? So what's the value of this professor? So in that sense, it is useful for us to think, to think again or to redefine what are the different tasks that we're asking our students to do. Because to be honest, is that whenever they go, they they graduate and they go out to the real world, they're going to be, they need to have some specific tools, some specific skills for them to face the real world. So again, just as Axel said it before, I think that this is an invitation for us to redefine these different teaching and learning processes. And in that sense, there is an opportunity for us to contribute to the literacy on artificial intelligence that every citizen and every person will need to have in the future, because this literacy will have will be key not only for academic integrity, but also for their professional life, because otherwise in the future we'll have just a society of liars. Rest ahead for us. 
Thank you very much for your reflection. And now let's move on to Mr. Rivas about this concern that this chat GPT has raised nowadays. Well, I think that the first thing is that the uh, the first thing that I'd like to say is that uh, it is a real concern, the one that we're facing now. We are facing a deep change now because what students used to do in, let's say, to avoid their, let's say, the responsibilities or their duties as it was expected is not there anymore. So now we can see how it has changed and we can see a before and an after. So in that sense, it is important to mention that there are many different tools. The one that is, uh, let's say, better known at this moment is ChatGPT, but there are many other tools that are there that might be even better and that are there available for students and that are, let's say, useful for us to, let's say, to test students because for example uh, here we can we have seen many in the san andreas university where i work at we have tested some of these uh tools that some of these traditional assessment tools and we can say that it passes these tests with eight over ten or six over ten but most of the times it is going to pass these tests so here we have a let's say a true challenge before us and we can see that this is just getting started. And of course, it is going to be perfected down the line or in the future. And that's the first challenge that we have ahead. But then on the other hand, we must think about the different plagiarism tools that students have. And we always had to battle those things. But those situations in general terms were mediated by someone else let's say by someone who knew about this specific matter and maybe we could cheat in quotes by asking some for for some help or maybe we could cheat by accessing different pieces or papers but now the biggest difference is that we don't need to ask anyone to do this for us but we can do it ourselves we can actually access to these let's say cheating mechanisms by ourselves and they don't need to be, uh, they don't feel any guilty because no one else is going to know about this. This is something that I do with myself. It is between me and the machine. And in that sense, there has to be some answers regarding these new situations. And by raising some, let's say, warnings, because just like Frances said it, this is a very good opportunity for us to wonder the way that we are assessing our students. So in that sense, there are four big alternatives for us to avoid plagiarism with these new technological devices. The first one is uh, the traditional one that has to do with the analogic in-person modality, which sometimes is necessary because we cannot, uh, let's say, be naive in front of this new reality. And we know that uh, we know that sometimes drafting essays takes a lot of time because we want we didn't want to use this time in class for them to do something that they could do back at home and we know that all of these thinking processes they take time and we know that this is not going to take two hours uh, by sitting in front of a computer and sometimes it needs many different processes and there are some different things that are let's say being lost whenever we have these in-person exams, but sometimes they're just necessary. And on the other hand, something else that Frances uh, mentioned and that we many different scholars agree with has to do with this training or yes, this training process or how, let's say, how continuous the process might be like. For example, whenever we propose a specific project, we could actually check how the different steps that have been undertaken have been successful in order to reach a final objective. So we could see how they could actually work on it and we could see the evolution of thinking or this evolution uh, of mindset has been like. So with that, I wouldn't mind if they actually use ChatGPT because they could actually have done it. But then we could actually see how their mind and how their thoughts evolved while advancing through the process. But the, to be honest, is 
but it is very difficult to do because we know that many different professors have to deal with many students at the same time and that's why it is very difficult to have this uh as to say customized uh teaching processes and that's why it is very difficult to implement so that's why it is forcing us to rethink about it so let's say this tutoring time this assistant time for example these teaching assistants how they work and how it is going to help us out in order to avoid this plagiarism because by having let's say this is step by step guide as we're going to be able to see the evolution of the way that they have advanced now in third place, we need to think about how the different, how these assessments are being drafted. Because there are some assessments that are properly answered by ChatGPT, but some others that are not. For example, the case studies on, for example, whenever we ask our students to perform some interviews, and we know that if they didn't talk to actual real people, there is no way for them to make something up. So I think that there are some assessments, some case studies, some let's say authentic exams that are going to, let's say that are going to avoid this chat GPT plagiarism. And the fourth tool has to do with working in a more explicit way in this integrity, this academic integrity. I think that we now have the greatest challenges uh, in the latest times that has to do with this integrity and how they are observers of their own behavior and to do so, be, let's say, besides saying this explicitly or beyond going this explicitness, uh, we have to say that we are educators, but it is also important to actually preach by example. And the best way is to actually make our courses to be coherent so we can actually let our students know the importance of what we're teaching. Because if they see, if our students see the importance of what they're doing, they wouldn't want a machine to do what they have to do. And they could see the importance of what they're doing later or later in life in their professional performance so that's why it is very important to underscore the importance of what we do and why we do it the way we do it in such way that we can avoid many misunderstandings because sometimes we actually have heard this in many different conversations in my university that if chat GPT can do it, then it's not worth it for a student to learn it because they can ask a machine to do it and then they wouldn't need to do it. And I would say that this is a mistaken idea because if we don't actually go through knowledge, this is not, we are not going to integrate this knowledge in, in the day-to-day -day way of thinking. I don't know what happened. And I don't know, of, let's say some historical facts and I never saw and I never conceptualized part of this. And if I never understood this, First of all, I cannot ask ChatGPT for think to think about it, and I cannot actually understand the importance of some historical events. So I need to have a let's say a general understanding of what history has been like. For example, what a monarchy is or what a republic is for me to be part of being a political being. And if I didn't have that in my mind, for example, as any other subjects such as arts, maths, or any other thing, or some other things, I cannot be replaced because I need to have this common knowledge. So it is important to have to value the knowledge that we need to have. And it is important for students not, and it is important so they are not replaced by machines. Thank you very much. And actually this last part comes together with our third question, which has to do with the strategies that are going to be incorporated for the critical thinking in higher education now that we have chat GPT. And I think that is perfectly fits what you have just said. And again, we are going to go back to our chatbot so it can answer first. Let's see what it has to say. Uh, 
again, we ask ChatGPT to behave as if it were an specialist in higher education to answer to these questions. And what kind of strategies are are they considering to incorporate with for critical thinking now that we have ChatGPT? You can see that it replies almost immediately, and it also says that it is going to be useful to promote critical thinking in higher education. However, it is important to remember that this critical thinking is a skill that is developed through different practices and experiences, and it does not depend on technology, or at least not exclusively. And it provides us with different examples, for example, triggering or encouraging critical thinking, underscoring the critical thinking for research, using critical thinking for learning processes, and finally, using different tools uh, for specific scenarios. Uh, as you realize, it is not possible for me to speak as ChatGPT replies, because it is very quick in its responses. And now before moving on to our panelists or to our expert panelists, and and taking advantage of the time we have, let me tell you a couple of things. I have seen that in the chat we have seen, in our chat box, we have seen that chat box usually answers in the same way, that it's very, let's say, repetitive in the way that it replies to the different questions. So the quality of the, re the, quality of the responses depends or is directly linked to the quality of the question. So, as you could see that by changing some of the questions of the same question, by changing some words in the different, in the same question, we would receive different responses. So that's something very important to have in mind. And as you have seen, this is a video that we're uh, rolling right now. And this is a video. And why is it a video? Because sometimes the free version of chat BT, whenever it gets to a, a maximum of users that are using the tool at the same time, it stops working. So in order to avoid so, in order to avoid any technical inconvenience, we recorded these videos beforehand. But uh, it is also important to remember that there is a paid version that you can access to, that any person can access to. Well, not any person, but only some people because ChatGPT is not available worldwide, but only in some of the, in some countries, and that's something for us to have in mind. And yes, I think that those were some of the comments that I wanted to raise before going back to our uh, expert panelists, so they can answer to this question: What kind of strategies do you consider necessary to promote critical thinking in higher education now that we have ChatGPT? So now we're going to go back to Mr. Pedro. I was just waiting for you. I, 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 was just, I was just waiting for someone to tell me something. I didn't know whether it was ChatGPT to tell me anything or it was Claudia. But I think that this is the most difficult questions of them all. Because as I said at the beginning, whenever I, when we start to think about when we started to think about this reflexive thinking, I think that we all agree on the importance of it, but no one takes any accountability for it. Uh, because it is important to here have this in mind because it is a key skill to have in this 21st century. And we all agree on the importance of this critical thinking, but I myself haven't found or haven't seen any person not to actually assess the, the, the different responsibilities students have, but they are not providing them, they're not providing students with this training on how to use these tools because the, here we're not going to talk about the result, but about the process. And just as Axel has said, it would change the conditions in which we were. But of course, we know that it hasn't been the case given the conditions that we operate in in our region. But in that sense, I think that it is key. On the other hand, I would say that regardless 
the accountability of each one of us has in that sense we are all responsible but at the same time nobody is i think that it's important to have a specific architecture for handling this critical thinking and in that sense i think that there's another element that is very important and i said it before i think i said it before and i think that in order to have this critical thinking it is important and axel said it differently but it is important for us to have the content or this background knowledge that we need to have in order to access this tool that means that we need to have some prior knowledge to be able to interact with this uh, chat GPT because it doesn't have to do with any specific theory or anything. And it is not, it is, it doesn't go against uh, the sharing or access of information, or at least I don't see it that way. But I think that for those people who believe that it goes against education, I think that it is important to see that these skills are based upon some specific prior knowledge. So that means that they are not operated in void. They are not in, let's say, they have to have some foundation. And Axel has already provided us with some examples. So in that sense, I would say that this function or this critical thinking function has to be promoted and has to be anchored in some specific knowledge in which I called the literacy on artificial intelligence or how this would have to be used with these uh, technological or technical devices that we are going or tools that we're going to have further down the line. But the question that I usually ask myself is, should we wait for students to come to our institutions for us to raise these concerns? Or if shouldn't we actually take these matters to our institutions to start thinking about this digital literacy that is going to be expanded? And on the other hand, and how this reflective thinking it is going to help us out to grow. And in that sense, I would like to raise two further insights. This reflective thinking or this critical thinking however you prefer to call it, has usually been linked to ideological debates. And of course, uh, people are right to say so, but I'd like to actually decompose this or to break it down to two main components. The first part is that this critical thinking, at least the one that we expect any professional to have or any scholar to have, for example, for the ones that have, um, being part of an entire education institution is a critical thinking that has been founded or that has been based in rationality or let's say in science-based or scientific-based evidence or empirically-based evidence or empiric-based foundations that is going to help us out to move further in these specialization fields. Of course, I'm not going to, to take too much by saying this, but we need to have, for example, these students of uh, uh, science or any of these uh, science students or uh, let's say, or this political or sociological background, it is not necessary to have this, let's say, this background to have this critical thinking, but it is important to have, let's say, this rationality behind everything that we do for us to understand what we do and why we do it in terms of the different steps that we follow us to achieve what we want to achieve when starting. So in other words, this is the kind of critical thinking that students are going to have after they have actually gone through this uh, education. That's why I go back to the question that I initially asked you, like, should we wait for students to actually give us these concerns or should we be propositive enough to actually do a bit more to create this kind of to create this kind of critical thinking if you allow me to say this enlightenment that we actually need to have for us to acquire this knowledge 
because even though we want to have this logical or this, this logical thinking, this reflective thinking, this rational thinking, this, let's say, science-based thinking, even though we know its limitations, because there are many different things to which science or this uh, critical thinking has not an answer for, it is good to know, to have these answers and to know what those answers are like. And with all modesty, we, we have to say that there are no answers for some questions. And in that sense, it is important to get to know that for us to actually face better these tools. And just like Axel has said it before, and specifically in his area of expertise, we have some specific data in terms of how we can connect the data that we have collected so far in our life experiences for us to operationalize not only the past, but also to have a better future and to predict a better future. And I think that, that with this mindset, it is with this mindset of having data in my life, it is best, in, in, it is better as if I didn't have any. And then it takes me to my second point. Whenever we talk about critical thinking, and in particular terms, whenever we talk about critical thinking in terms of pedagogy, we're not talking about a specific function, let's say this self-thinking process of how we perceive ourselves as subjects, as agents, and how we understand ourselves in this society, and how we wonder or how we ask all of these questions, in which we don't wonder about why, but who is going to benefit these actions. And I think that this critical thinking in that sense has a lot to do with the way that we commit ourselves in this academic scenario for us to promote a better society and a more sustainable economy. Because today we're talking, as of today, we're talking about the 2030 agenda. And you can see how it is present in our background, in our background images for all of us. And of course, it is part of our concerns for the for our future. But without a doubt, one way to achieve this, it is not only, let's say, limited to the responsible use of water or to the responsible use of the resources that we have, but it, it is also demanding from us that regardless the professional area that you are working on, it is important that we can manage to develop in students this commitment to sustainability. Or, or isn't it there any better to sustainability than this? You can tell me. And because not only in the Latin American countries, but in also, but also in some other countries, such as our neighbors in the north or in Europe, it, we all know that it is very important for students not only to be in line with an ideological mainstream or streamline, uh, or for example, why I am why I follow uh, the Barca uh, soccer team because I have never thought about following any other soccer team in my life because I was born with some specific conditions that actually took me to to follow this specific soccer team and I should and actually to be honest my kids are also following the same thing but we're not talking about this we're not talking about this tradition but we're talking on how education has the power to transform subjects to be better or to have a better society and how they can contribute to have a better and more and, and a richer society in terms of academic and in terms of scientific advances. And that can only be achieved through this critical thinking. And this will take me back to the beginning, which is thinking about the problems that we have to this. And I think that for scientific scientists, this critical thinking has to do with questioning the methods, questioning the authors that you know, questioning the experiments, questioning everything that we know as we know it. And it is also going to create, and it is also going to create these agents of change in this society that we have. And it is specifically scientists who are reminding us that in terms of sustainability, we are on edge. So that's why we must guarantee that 
all our students are being given this opportunity to critically to critically think about the reality they have before them, because maybe they are going to produce new solutions to the new challenges that we have. But it is important that they, at the beginning, quite question why, and as I said, that we promise. So who is it going to be benefited down the line? Uh, by having these uh, specific economical and social advances and what can we do? Because that's the thing with this critical thinking, because if we don't do anything with this critical thinking, then it is useless. And that's why it is important to take action upon these specific um, initiatives of critical thinking. So that's why it is very important for every single higher education institution to provide students with opportunities for them to have those critical thinking scenarios. So in conclusion, I think that there is a lot to do, but we have to start by the foundations. And it starts with a good literacy initiatives and good, let's say, dissemination of this rational thinking. And with this, I would like to conclude, but I think that it has to do with the responsibility and accountability of the higher education, because to get started with, we're, we're working here with a great population of the edu of a society, and it and it is not only the people who are going through higher education, but it should be something that should be tackled by society itself. Well, without a doubt, this is a cross-cutting uh, aspect that we consider whenever we think about this critical thinking. But now with this tool as ChatGPT, we wonder about it again. So, uh, Dr. Rivas, so what do you think, or what strategies do you think could be implemented in order to promote this critical thinking now that we have ChatGPT? Well, I think that we're living times of acceleration in comparison to the things that we have seen in the past, and we have already gotten used to those advances that we have seen in the latest years, but now, we are seeing all of this progress differently because we have seen how, for example, we spend more time before a screen or in front of a screen. And this created at the same time a specific trend in such a way that our thoughts or the exposition or the how exposed we were to some ideas and how this could be driven by algorithms. And in that sense, by having this algorithm organization, there is a trend to reinforce what we used to think, that we live in a specific sort of a bubble and how we can, let's say, bump at the things that go against our bubble. Because whenever we go online on Twitter or any social media, we're trying to reinforce what we have already seen, what we already knew. So uh, by handling these bubbles or by, let's say, working on these biases and how we could use these biases to reaffirm what we used to believe is something that has been reinforced with this artificial intelligence that is simulating realities with a specific exponential, exponential power that is just getting started. So now we see the possibility of creating images. For example, we can create people that are not even real, and it is not possible for us to differentiate from a person from a real person. So uh, we can actually ask someone to say something that they never said. So we no longer know what reality is going to be like. And here we can also interact with us with a big let's say, learning machine that we don't even know whether it's true or false what they're saying. We don't know where all of this information is coming from and what kind of criteria they use to actually raise the things that they are doing. So let's say that now we are more, uh, we're living in a world in which our minds are more malleable and they're like easily shaped. So that's why we need to have a more powerful educational tool, even though we know that this tool was already weak, we need to rethink about the design of our universities and about these academic scenarios. And on top of that, we should provide a new additional layer 
which could be named in different ways. For example, this digital literacy or computational thinking or whatever you want to name it. But I think that it's important to actually introduce students as soon as possible, specifically for the higher education uh, stages to introduce them to these technologies in a very sound way for them to understand what are the different implications of using these tools in their day-to-day -day work. And this is something that our students or that everyone should actually be aware of, how they can actually shield themselves from this fake information that could be released. Because this is important for every single citizen because otherwise their mind could be easily shaped and could be easily taken to vote on some specific aspects or to believe some different things. So that's why I think that this computational thinking or this uh, digital literacy is very important for citizens themselves because of, for our society, because we need to be able to train critical thinkers that are looking forward to the truth and that or that are seeking the truth and it is important not only for the ecosystem that we actually that we are in uh, when we reinforce the things that we used to believe in but it is important in that sense to have this to have let's say this cognitive restructuring as Piaget would say it and it is not the same, let's say, reading about something and then being tested on it. But here we need to have a cognitive change or this cognitive restructure. We need to have this kind of shielding layer that is going to make us doubt or make us question the supposed or the, tr the supposed truth that we're receiving. And how we can actually question how reliable that information is. So that's why we gotta be very careful because it'd be easier to say that something happened and to establish that something was a fact because we used to have that in the past whenever we saw the newspaper and we saw some specific facts being claimed there and we would believe those facts as the truth. But now we need to have an epistemological change for us to be able to question absolutely everything that we receive because they seem every single information that we receive seems to be factual, seems to be true, but we need to verify what are the sources. Uh, but we know it'd be, it'd be important to actually be able to verify the sources where this information is coming from. But of course, this is a tedious process that takes time and it is easier for us to go back to the sur go back to it and just believe that it's the truth. But it is important for that in that sense to have a systematic view or a systematic understanding of it. And sometimes we see that in some, for example, in some exercises that I usually do with my students or with my teachers or my faculty members. And I actually ask him some questions in which I ask him what was the case in which, in which they believe something was true or not. And then we have this breaking point in which we can see what are the, for example, emotional breakup points in which we can actually identify as something being true or not. So that's why it is important to understand how you have been tricked to believe in something that was not true. So that's, I think, the best way of, let's say, planting or let's say some sort of decoding mechanism in which you are going to doubt what you are being given and that is going to provide you as a citizen to be shielded against this constant invasion of messages or information that we receive on a day-to-day -day basis and sometimes we're not able to process all of that amount of information for example if you see all of the different TikTok information that you receive you are not able to process all that information, but that information is going to go back to your unconscious being, and you don't even know what kind of consumption it is going to create in the way that you see the world and how, and for example, if we receive all of this information through different stimuli, I think that just questioning what we receive, it is just 
one of our obligations or one of our responsibilities as citizens. And this takes us back to the importance of programming. This was an issue that we discussed some years back in terms of how students should learn to program and to develop software. And I think that this was a very interesting issue because without programming, it is not possible to understand a new language. In the new language, the new emerging language. It is as if you didn't know, as if you didn't know how to read or write. But by having this literacy and by and by knowing how this programming is conducted, it is not possible for us to understand how the world is being set up today. And so that's why it is important to have this introduction to programming, but it is also important to understand the codes and to understand the environment and above all, to be able to be somehow, to be somehow aware on how we can be easily manipulated by those codes. It is not one thing or another, but we need to have this critical thinking and this training for this professional uh, performance, but given the specific effects that we have seen so far, it is important to have this critical thinking on citizenship and how it is going to be adapted to this professional performance that our students are going to have in the real world. And in that sense, it is not it is not to be understood as one thing or another thing, but it is something that has to be implemented in every single major, in every single program. So in that sense, this critical thinking course should be implemented in every single in, in every single career and every single program, because otherwise no one is going to be accountable to do so. And this is something that was introduced last year, and it is something that is becoming, let's say, part of our core subjects such as math such as philosophy such as any other core subject because it besides uh, because uh it doesn't matter if they are engineers or accountants or medical doctors but we want them to have let's say this core foundation of some specific matters i think that this is just another matter that should be implemented there for them to have a better let's say a better learning process Thank you very much, and thank you for raising up this aspect of having these literacy initiatives. And in that sense, our institute, our online institute, in line or synchronized with these needs, it is going to launch a quick, a quick guideline or a quick guide in terms of how to use this artificial intelligence, specifically with ChatGPT. And we're also proposing uh, a webinar uh, with campus ESL and in order to have a better management of these tools. And now without any further ado, it is our director's turn to actually introduce us to these two important aspects. So yes, now you can say, thank you very much. Now you can see a QR code where you can actually access the English or Spanish version of this chat GPT guide, which we believe it is one of the first ones and without a doubt, the first one that UNESCO has released in terms of how to use chat GPT and how we can reflect upon this tool in terms of the use of its use in higher education. If we had to actually present this um, guide in academic terms, we would say that this is, let's say, an introductory manual or a handbook in which some key concepts are explained in terms of how ChatGPT works and how it works. But the most important thing here is to say, as uh, some people are telling me that this QR code is not working, uh, I don't know if uh, maybe some of my colleagues can help me out to figure this out. Otherwise, we can actually share this information through our chat box. But anyway, so uh, as you, as Axel has mentioned it, ChatGPT is just one of the many different tools on artificial intelligence that are that we have available nowadays. So that's why here we want to actually provide an initial 
introduction for professors and students and the whole academic um, scenario, the whole academic stakeholders, for them to understand what are the different ways to use it and what are the different ethical concerns that there might be in terms of its use, which we know it is just inevitable in terms of how it is going to permeate in higher education. In that sense, this guide also offers some indications on how to find or yes, how, on how to find different artificial intelligence tools to be implemented in different higher education instances. And here you can see, and the cover, you can see an image that is completely uh, blurred. And actually this image, we wanted it to have, let's say we wanted it to be very impressionist just to go back to the artistic movement from the 19th century. But this image was generated by an artificial intelligence mechanism. So that's why it is important to highlight that aspect. Uh, so we hope that, that this guide that we also want uh, your feedback from, uh, we hope that this guide is just the beginning of many more debates as to say how these tools are going to be further developed and they are going to be more sophisticated in the future. So please make the decisions that you believe are going to be, have to be made, but please, and we encourage you to make informed decisions because it is important or we all should know about all of this is about because these tools are already in the lives of our students. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Let's go to the next slide, please. All right, thank you. So at the same time, uh, going beyond this guide, we also wanted to offer you with a seminar in our, in our campus, in our institute campus, we have two different versions, one in Spanish and one in English, that it is nothing but a training course, because we know that for some people, maybe for some people, the guide would be enough, but for some others, if uh, they would like to actually access more information on this aspect, and they would like to actually delve into it, that's why we have designed this webinar, this seminar that is going to be available on our website for you to access to it in a collaborative manner uh, for you to see what this training what this asynchronous or these online courses might be like in terms of this in terms of this very interesting subject and of course we have specialists on this aspect that could actually help us out to better understand what these a chat GPT and artificial intelligence is all about. And as you can see, all of this information is available both in Spanish and English. And as usual, uh, I can just rest, uh, I can ensure you that we are fully committed to it. Claudia, let's go back to you. Uh, yes, thank you very much. We are fully convinced that this guide and also our seminar will be absolutely useful for these times in which science fiction is almost a reality nowadays. Again, uh, the recording of this uh, webinar is going to be available in our YouTube channel. And we would like to thank you all of you for your participation, because with you, we have broken a record. And we hope that we are going to continue to raise these figures in participation for our next webinars. But uh, uh, thank you very much for your very rich reflections. And hopefully we can continue working on this and hopefully we can actually process all of this information in time so we can actually process it for you. And with that, I'd like to say goodbye and I'd like to pass it over to our director too for his closing remarks. Uh, just like you, I just wanted to express my gratitude to Axel Rivas, to Professor Axel Rivas, because it is a true pleasure to learn 
from him and i hope that this is not going to be the the, the last time we see each other because maybe in the future we'll get to see each other again and on the other hand i also wanted to thank the whole unesco yesalk team and also the research team and also the communications team technology team and all of you all of the logistics that have been performed for us to actually put together this event because as we said before this has been a record for all of us i don't think that we even and the main headquarters they have managed such a big event such as this one and lastly i would like to uh, confess something here uh i'm actually i am not frances pedro and i'm not the director of the institute but I am an, I'm just an avatar created by ChatGPT. As you can imagine, this is a joke. This is just a joke, I'm joking. But please have this in mind because maybe in future years, this is going to happen. Actually, uh, I lived something a lot, pretty much alike and I had this in a Chinese university where I had the opportunity to actually be part of an English class with a professor that was in the screen and I thought that this person was in another room, but it was an artificial intelligence professor. At UNESCO, we are not as sophisticated yet, but you never know. And maybe in the future, we're gonna get to that point. But as of now, we are always at your service. Thank you very much. And hopefully we can get to see you each and we can get to see each other later in the future. Thank you very much.